Good morning, everyone. Uh, as was mentioned a moment ago, my name is Bernie Roebuck. I'm currently the principal at Finlay High School in the southern part of the Riverina, and this is my 15th year as a, a secondary principal. I also speak to you as the deputy president of the New South Wales Secondary Principals Council. So clearly I'm no expert on water, and I'm probably not an expert on anything else for that matter. But I have lived and worked in communities along the Murray Valley for 35 years, and I think that gives me some small claim of knowing a little bit about our rural communities. For 97 years and four generations, my family have lived in this part of the world. And it certainly gives us a vested interest in the future of these communities. So what does the Murray-Darling Basin Plan have to do with school principals? As I hope I stated very clearly some months ago yeah, in Denilquin in December last year, the reason for our existence our students are the group of people that will be most affected by the final decision that is made in regard to the Basin Plan. The full effects of these proposals will fall on my children's heads and on their children, and we must not forget this. This is my second stint at Finlay High School. I went there in 1990 as a head teacher, and at that time the population of the school was 720. In December last year, I spoke in Deniliquin, the population of our school was 450. And at the moment, it's 420. In a 22 year period, that's a decline of 41%. So, have students left our school because it's a failing school? I think not. By any standard applied, we continue to have huge successes academically in the arts and sport. I proudly say we have a great school, not a perfect one, but one where there is success evident everywhere. The enrolment, dec the enrolment decline is a similar story across all parts of the Riverina. Less students means we can give our students less options in terms of curriculum choice. Recruiting staff is more challenging. Many schools struggle to get quality people to take up leadership roles. It means the pool of quality students in each year group continues to get smaller. And this can have a critical impact on student outcomes. But it goes further, of course. Of great concern to our students is their life after school. Increasingly, they know that local jobs are hard to come by. Increasingly, they see no future in their local communities. Employers are cautious about employing more people and have been for many years, and rightly so. The young ones also, also see the facilities and attractions of their local communities slipping away. And increasingly, they seek work away from these communities, so not surprisingly, they have less and less young people. Less students means less teaching staff, less ministry staff. It affects the builders, the plumbers, the electricians, the local grocers, the bus drivers, who are all connected to schools. And so the income that disappears from the local economy and the multiplier effect it has on local business continues to roll out. So why is there this significant decline in school enrolments? We can accept that this is connected to local population. We accept that some of it's connected to the changes in the agricultural technology, a 10 year drought and lower commodity prices. It's also connected to the fact that for a very long time these communities have lived with the huge shadow of uncertainty hanging over their head that's been created by the public policy over water. It's also true that over the past two decades, governments of all persuasions, state and federal, have never wasted a single opportunity to close down or, wipe or wind back government agencies or departments in our rural areas. What's actually happened in the seven months since the water rallies at the end of last year? There's been some sympathy for our situation, some empathy and some understanding. The Murray-Darling Basin Authority's most recent plan talks at some length about providing significant funding for on-farm and off-farm infrastructure programs. We applaud this because such investments would give and provide water savings as well as providing employment base that would give rural communities hope. But we need more than hope. We need the evidence in rock-solid sign-off projects and an assurance that these promises are not empty vessels or more promises from Canberra. I think we all know about promises from Canberra. And the most recent version of the plan says, and I quote, the authority acknowledges that some communities will likely be more vulnerable to the impacts moving to the proposed sustainable limits on water diversions. How easy it is to say that some communities are expendable when your livelihood is not at stake. By way of contrast, I say, why does Sydney not have a second airport at the moment? The cost of the surrounding suburbs is considered to be too great. Those communities, it is deemed, should not have to endure the downsides of an airport. 
So why should our communities be expendable? Well, remember, these are rural folk and rural communities. They're used to dealing. They're used to dealing with drought. They're used to dealing with flood. So what's a bit less water? They also endure higher fuel prices, higher food costs, poorer medical facilities and poorer educational outcomes than any other part of this country. But they will learn to cope with less, as they always have. Country folk are tough. They are resilient. They will battle on. And just in case you haven't forgotten, there is not as many of them, and unlike the suburbs that are around the second airport, they have little political clout. Rural people are bitterly disappointed with the lack of respect that's being accorded to them. So many of the families whose kids come to my school are hardworking. They are fair, reasonable people. These are not people who live on handouts, who lack personal drive, or, do not, or who do not make a contribution to our country. So many of them have enormous pride in what they have achieved, and enormous pride in their little part of the world. If you really want to understand what the term community means, if you really want to understand what it means for people to look after their own in times of a crisis, don't go to Turak, or Mossman, or Yarralumla. But you might find it in Berrigan, in Jerildri, in Yenda, in Denny, in Hay, in Tarbogan, and countless other rural communities. So why would we not want vibrant, sustainable rural communities that have the promise of a future? Places that offer families the promise of affordable housing, a quality of life and opportunities if only the resources were afforded them. I want to be environmentally conscious. I want to be certain that we have a sustainable future. But we live in a country with 26 million people and we simply cannot have a pristine environment with that number of people. The hypocrisy in regard to the environment never ceases to amaze me. Where are the environmental concerns around the disaster that is Gladstone Harbour in Queensland or the potential impact of coal, coal seam gas mining? Such developments are perceived to be in the public interest and therefore environmental costs are deemed acceptable. Growing food and fibre, however, it appears, presents a totally unacceptable environmental cost. The mining sector clearly brings in wealth to the nation. Sadly, it does nothing in terms of developing long-term sustainable communities. Growing food and fibre in a world with exponential population growth is and can significantly add to the nation's wealth. But it will also ensure that we have quality, sustainable communities that flow from it. Clearly, this is a no-brainer. Our communities in the Riverina do not want to hear from the Murray-Darling Basin Authority that a few percent fall in population in the scheme of things is not much. Can anyone imagine the CEO of Rio Tinto or BHP accepting that? I, hear that, I fear that in the end we are expendable and that the pressure will be brought to bear for the New South Wales Government to sign off on this plan so that federal money flows into the coffers of the New South Wales Government to shore up, shore up such projects as a North West Rail Line or another harbour crossing. As I've said to Education Minister Adrian Pickley many times, it is not acceptable that our young people should have a second-rate education system. They are entitled to the same quality system as those in the elite postcodes of the coast. Exactly the same principle applies to the people of rural communities. We are not the underclass and we are entitled to a quality of life. In conclusion, I want to give my students and my communities hope. We do not want to see the river system in a state of total disrepair. We are not environmental vandals. We accept that there must be environmental balance in all we do. We would never want there to be an environmental disaster that would threaten the future for our kids. But we need some common sense and we need some balance. The kids, the families, the staff of my school are real people. The absolute vast majority of them are people of real substance. I want my community to vigorously support the concept of long-term sustainability. We will look for solutions. We will look for compromise. We are prepared to make some sacrifice, but it must be a shared sacrifice. Please, we beg you, do not sell us out. We are capable of making a massive contribution to the wealth and well-being of this country. Thank you very much.